Hey everybody and welcome to today's video. I am Medi Fizman, a medical physicist who has spent my whole life studying how radiation interacts with the body for the purpose of helping to improve how we image and treat disease. Not only am I a scientist, but I am also a big buff of scientific history. And so I am super excited about today's video because we are going to talk about this, the discovery of the x-ray by this man, William Conrad Rentkin, one of my all-time favorite scientists. In December 1895, he published this paper, Über einen nur Art von Strahlen, or On a New Kind of Ray. <laughs> now, my German grandma is rolling over in her grave right now at how bad my pronunciation was there, so I apologize for that. But we know that Rentkin published his paper in December 1895, and within one year, there had already been over a thousand publications and over 50 books written about x rays and their characteristics and how they can be used for medicine. And in 1901, Rentkin was awarded the very first Nobel Prize for his discovery, rightfully so. We also know, though, as far back as the early 1700s, people were doing experiments with statically charged glass globes and evacuated pipes and mercury vapor pumps and cathode ray tubes, and they were describing phenomena and even producing rough images by what we now know were x-rays. And so why is it that Rentkin's paper gets credit for being the discovery of the x-ray when all these other scientists were doing work and probably producing x-rays long before that? So it really all comes down to what makes a discovery. So we're gonna talk about that today, and we're gonna talk about what Rentkin did in his paper to warrant the credit for discovery of the x-ray. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so what makes a discovery? Now there's no official rule book, scientific rule book published that I know about this is what makes a discovery, but from what I've learned over the course of my career and what I've read, it basically comes down to you do some experiments, you notice something, some new phenomena. So you hypothesize, you say, hey, something new's happening here. You identify here, here it is, can you see it? And you give it a name. You study it, you describe its properties, you talk about how to use it, and then you take all that information, everything you've learned, and you put it into a publication and you publish it and you let other people read it in a way that they could also go out and reproduce your experiments and see for themselves what happens. So all of this, in my opinion, if you do all that and you're the first one to do it, then yes, you get credit for the discovery. So let's talk about people who worked previously to Rentkin who were doing things that could have been the discovery of the x-ray. If you look in 1709, Francis Housky, he produced did a lot of experiments, uh, published and presented this paper about statically charged glass globes. So he had some globes and some of them were covered in wax, partially covered in wax. And he noticed that when he would statically charge them and touch them, that he would see this burst of light and see what he said was the shadow or he could see his hand through the opaque wax. So it would suddenly appear. And so what we think is happening is you had the static charge, when he touched it, it was discharged. The electrons were accelerated, slamming into things, creating X-rays. So when electrons slam into things, they create X-rays, which created luminescence in the wax. And so what we were seeing was basically electroluminescence. But I think he was actually creating X-rays when he did this. Then there's William Morgan, 1785. He was looking at evacuated glass cylinders. So he had basically what was a predecessor to the mercury vapor lamp. So he would pull a vacuum with a mercury pump. And when he passed charge, electric charge through it, he saw what he described as invisible light that would pass through it. Now, how he saw it, if the light was really invisible, I don't know, but he talked about it. And so I think he was actually producing x-rays that was producing this light. And so then there's also Sir William Crookes who came later on in the 1800s, and he produced what was the predecessor of the current day cathode ray tube. So it was the very first one. You had a cathode on one end, an anode on the other end. You applied a high voltage. And in between there, there was a metal target inside of his Crookes tube, as it was called. So he did experiments, and he saw that the walls would emit blue light 
and he put a high voltage across it, and he noticed when he had photographic plates nearby that they would get foggy and exposed. And so he talked about this, and he talked about it in terms of a radiant form of matter, and he thought this was actually cathode rays or electrons that were causing this phenomena on his photographic plates. So I don't think he really discovered or knew that he was producing x-rays, but I think he was. And to be honest with you, I think he should get a lot of credit in science for that mustache. This has got to be one of the greatest mustaches in the all-time history of science. Personally, I think Sir William Crooks's mustache should have its own YouTube channel. I would subscribe to that. Then there is Johann or Ivan Puloj. He described, he did a lot of work, and he actually designed the predecessor to the current x-ray tube that we have today. So it was an anode and a cathode, and in between it, at an angle, he put this calcium sulfide aluminum disc, right? So he was trying to make a light bulb, so the electrons would slam into the calcium sulfide, produce light. But when you slam electrons into metal, like aluminum, they are going to produce x-rays. And so it's basically the same design as you see in a modern x-ray tube. Electrons hit a target that's at an angle, x-rays come out. So he actually produced a paper talking again about, in the same uh, way Crookes did, a radiant form of matter. So he was thinking that these were electrons that were creating radiation. And so he actually reported on using this to produce images, radiant images of cadavers. Now we don't know exactly what these images look like or anything, but I think he was creating x-rays. He was using them to make an image. He just didn't know they were x-rays at the time. And then there's everybody's favorite Serbian genius, Nikolai Tesla. Just about the same time that Rinkin was doing his research, Tesla was also doing research with x-rays and he produced what he called an x-ray light bulb. Later on, it was known as that. He produced this light bulb, fluorescent light bulb, where he took a cathode ray to, he slammed the electrons into the side that were covered again with phosphorescent material to produce light. And so he said when he was using these, he again reported damage and fogging on photographic plates that were nearby. And he said the origin of this radiant energy that's exposing my photographic plates comes from the point where the cathode ray tube or cathode rays hit the side of my tube. And so what he did, he used his bulb and he tried to take an image of his good friend Mark Twain one time. And the whole thing was exposed and blacked out except for a spot where a screw in the lens was. You could see the screw on the plate. And people think, well, what he did right there is produce a radiograph of the screw in that lens. Unfortunately, we will never know because Mark Twain and Nikolai Tesla spent a lot of time together and they liked to hang out at his lab and do experimental weird stuff. And we know from other things that Tesla liked to do stuff like this in his lab. So he's probably hanging out with Mark and he says, hey, Mark, you wanna see me shoot four million volts of electricity across my lab? And Twain's like, uh, yeah, I do. So unfortunately, Tesla's lab burns down and all of his work on x-rays are lost in the fire. So we don't really know what Tesla knew or what he had discovered. So throughout all of this, we have all these people doing work where x-rays are being produced, right? Say so some of them even hypothesize something new is happening here. There's a radiant form of matter, as some of them said. They studied and some of them produced images and talked about the properties, but nobody ever identified them as a new type of matter. They never said this is something new. They always thought they were dealing with electrons or cathode rays, right? So they never published a paper explaining this is a new type of matter and here are the properties of that matter. That was left to Rentkin in his paper. And so, as you can imagine, we're going to discuss Rentkin's paper. We are going down that rabbit hole, and we're going to look at his paper and look at all the cool stuff he did in that paper. All right, Rentkin's paper. In page one, paragraph one, he explains he was doing some experiments with some Crookes tubes, and he noticed fluorescence on some screens across the room. He also noticed visible light being produced from his Crookes tube. So we wondered, is this from things that are producing the visible light or what's producing this fluorescence? So what he did is he took his Crookes tube and he covered it in opaque paper. So now the visible light can't get out. He then turned it on and he saw the fluorescence show up again. It still showed up on his fluorescent screen across the room. 
even if he turned the screen around so it's not facing his crook's tube, it was still there. And at a distance of up to two meters, he could still see fluorescence. So this led him to say, hey, something is being produced that can penetrate this black paper. And it's not visible light, because visible light and other types of light can't get through this paper, right? So something new is happening here. So he, he hypothesized he's producing something new. There's a new kind of ray. He then says, okay, he does what every self-respecting scientist is going to do. He starts grabbing things. He grabs a couple packs of cards, probably the cards he used to cheat Baccarel and maybe, uh, you know, even Henri Curie out of money. He grabs a pack of cards. He puts it in. He says, look, whatever's being produced can go through these cards. Uh, it can go through the tin foil I used to wrap yesterday's sandwich in. Uh, a couple pieces of wood. He grabs those, puts it in. Nope, still penetrates that. Even a 1,000-page book. Whatever's being produced can penetrate straight through all of those things and produce the fluorescence. So he even grabs a sheet of aluminum. So he says a sheet of aluminum, 15 millimeters thick, still allowed the X-rays to pass. Aha! So there it is, the very first use of the word X-ray ever in the history of humanity. He says, I will call them X-rays for the sake of brevity, because he didn't know what they were. He knew they were something different. And he Right there. That's it. He's identified them and he's given them a name. We now have a name for this new phenomenon. It's called the X-ray. He then continues his work. Okay, water, other fluids, copper, several types of metals, even lead, you know, 1.5 millimeters thick. They can all penetrate. And he characterizes them and he says, look, these rays have the characteristics such that it's the density and the thickness of a material which determines how they're absorbed and how well they penetrate. He takes them and he puts them through a prism. He says, okay, they're not reflected or refracted like visible light is. So there's something different than visible light. He sets up his screen. He puts some stuff behind it. And he says, even if I pass them through the screen, I still see an image. So they're being reflected. They can be reflected. He then does some other work where he says, look, as I move my screen away, the intensity of the fluorescence I get drops by 1 over r squared. These things are not deflected by magnets. So based on those properties, he says, these are not cathode rays because they don't have the same properties of these cathode rays everybody else has been studying. They're not optical photons, but they're kind of similar. So what's he doing? He's describing their properties. He's characterizing them. And then he says, well, again, like every self-respecting scientist, myself included, if I had some weird phenomena that I didn't know anything about, what's the first thing I would do? Yeah, I'd stick my hand in it. That's exactly what he did. He stuck his hand in this X-ray beam and he saw a picture of his hand, right? He says, I could see my bones and the fog or the haze of the skin around it. And so this was the very first x-ray image of Rintgen's hand. Now, in the publication, we got an image of his wife's hand. So he took that as probably the second image because he probably went and got his wife and said, honey, honey, look at this awesome thing I got, right? So he had to show her immediately. So he says, I have observed and photographed shadows and pictures. He even takes it and says, I'm going to put it outside. I'm going to shoot him through my door. And he got an image of his door. So this is basically the very first x-ray composition analysis anybody ever did. Shot x-rays through to see what something was made of. You could also think of it this way. This was the very first radiation shielding survey. Where's the shielding in my wall at? Where do I need more shielding? That sort of thing. Right here in Rintgen's paper. So he did a lot in this very first paper, right? He published it. He then, over the course of this work, what we saw in this paper, so he's hypothesized something new, he's identified it, gave it a name, he studied, described all the properties of it, they put all that together in a publication, published it for the world to see, and completely changed the course of humanity, in my opinion. So, Rinkin publishes his paper in 1895, and within one year, you had already had the demonstration of the use of x-rays for medical imaging, to help diagnose and treat different diseases and conditions. You saw the use of x-ray imaging on the battlefield to help diagnose uh, soldiers' injuries and treat soldiers' injuries. And then in the early 1900s, you saw the development of mobile x-ray units. And as the century continued, you saw the development of dedicated radiology and medical imaging departments that used x-ray imaging to diagnose and ever-expanding wide array of diseases and conditions. And then 
In 1967, you saw the next big change. You saw the development of computed axial tomography, CAT scans. By 1971, we had our very first dedicated CT scanner. And on the very first patient they scanned, they were able to diagnose a brain lesion in that patient for the first time non-invasively. They didn't have to put anything into that patient's brain to diagnose this lesion for the first time ever in history. And so that just set off an ever-expanding development of radiography, digital radiography, organ-specific radiography, 4D CT, image-guided radiotherapy. All these things have happened since then. And that's just the uh, medical imaging applications. What about in other areas of science? In 1963, they strapped an X-ray imager to a rocket, shot it into space, and got the first images of X-ray emission from the sun, developing a whole new area of astronomy, X-ray astronomy. So now they can image X-ray emission from large planets, from uh, not so not so planet planets, smaller things, big things like. I don't know, black holes, nebulas. They can use X-ray imaging to better understand the fundamental nature of our universe around us. And then think about this also. In 1951, from the lab of Rosalind Franklin, came Photograph 51. This was an X-ray diffraction image of DNA, and it helped us decode the shape and makeup of DNA. Again, further changing how we understand ourselves, our bodies, how we do medicine. Everything changed from this, all because of an x-ray image. We can now do intracellular x-rays, chromosomal x-rays, all these things nowadays. All of this stemming from this first paper created by William Rentgen, one of the greatest scientists ever. Well, okay, Willie, don't get full of yourself. This was a great discovery, but you're still a scientist, so let's keep it together. But anyway, guys, that's what I have. This is a whole rundown of the discovery of x-rays and Rentkin's paper. So I hope you found this informational. I hope it informed you. I hope you learned something from it. And hey, I'm going to make more videos in the future about the history of x-rays. I hope that's interesting to you. I hope you like it. If you do, let me know down below. Leave me a like, you know, whatever. And we will see you guys in the next video. Oh, and if you just noticed what the hawk did there at the end when he landed, uh, leave that down below. The first person to tell me what the hawk did when he landed, I will give you a shout out in my next video if you leave me a comment down below. So talk to you later, guys. Thanks.